Thanks for having me here this afternoon. <clears throat> so um, I was as surprised as anyone else by yesterday's or, uh, election results. Um, but I felt like maybe I should have known better. And it's not because my organization works with data. We do. We don't work with election data, though. Um, it's because I should have known through our work that data is only useful if you have an understanding of what it's trying to describe. I was as obsessed with the data as anyone else. Uh, we had a lot of it. Um, but I think we were all looking at the data and we missed the people. Uh, I want to tell you about one of the people I think we missed. Uh, her name is Renee. Uh, she's a single mother of two girls, four and six, and she was doing freelance work when she got sick, and she started falling behind in her bills. And she did what about half of all of Americans will do at some point in their lives, and that means uh, she reached out for help from the government through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. What she did first is she heard that there was an enrollment event near her in the evening. So she went to that. There were a couple dozen uh, eligibility workers there to help her. Uh, and everyone showed up and waited for a while. And eventually they came out and said, the computer systems are down. I'm very sorry. You're going to have to, we're going to cancel this event. But you can go to a county welfare office tomorrow and wait in line and get your benefit. At that point, she was actually working in uh, a retail job, and she couldn't get the time off to go during the day. So she said, I can apply online. Now, California does have an online enrollment system, um, but it doesn't work on a mobile phone. So she decided to go to a library where there was access to a computer with the internet. And she started this process of applying for what's known in California as CalFresh, where I live. And she got about uh, 30 minutes through the program, and then, of course, the computer timed out on her, didn't save her work. And that would happen over and over again because the online application for food stamps in California is 52 screens long. It has over 215 questions. And some of those questions, there's a whole page of questions that are variants on this one. Um, have you or any member of your family traded food benefits for drugs, ammunition, or uh, guns since April 20th, 1996? So I don't know how Renee voted. I don't know if she voted in the election. Um, but on Wednesday, I woke up thinking about her and uh, the two to three million other Americans I'm sorry, two to three million other Californians, just in California, who are eligible for food assistance and the, but not receiving it because of the same kinds of problems that Nate, Renee ran into. And uh, Renee is not alone in this, obviously. Uh, we have all of these people who are reaching out. They're asking for help, and I kind of feel like we're doing is giving them the middle finger over and over again. And for them, it's the government giving you the middle finger. It's the establishment. So what do we do about that? Well, what I would ask you is, you've probably been frustrated with government, too. You felt that kind of getting the middle finger. Maybe it was at the DMV. Maybe you were getting a permit for business or your house remodel. But imagine for a second all that frustration that you felt, and instead what's at stake is food on the table for your kids? Or imagine what's at stake is the custody of your kid? Or imagine that it's your own freedom because you got a traffic ticket and you had to choose between taking an entire day off of work and standing in line to clear that ticket. You couldn't take the day off of work and now there's a bench warrant that's out for your arrest. Uh, and the next time that you make a left turn when you shouldn't, the cop is going to pull you over and take you to jail. That happens a lot. There's a lot of bench warrants in this country. Uh, I read in the New York Times last year that there was a community in Missouri in 2013 that had a bench warrant and a half per person. That was Ferguson. So we have a lot of these. <laughs> and the consequences of this are not just the frustration of people. It's really our democracy, I think, that's at stake. 
we know that if we can't put up a website that works, we can't govern. And we know that, and I know Sylvia learned that very well. Um, uh, we learned that, learned that with healthcare.gov. Uh, but we keep learning this. Uh, I live in California. We passed something called Prop, 40, uh, Prop 47. It allows people with very low level and usually pretty old felony convictions on their record to remove them or, or reduce them to misdemeanors. And that's important. Because if you have a felony on your record, you can't get a job. You can't get uh, student loans, you can't get housing, and you are basically stuck in a cycle of poverty. And this is not great for Californians, it's not great for California taxpayers, because poverty turns out to be pretty expensive to taxpayers. They're the highest utilizers of these systems. So we put something on the ballot. This is what we do in California. We put things on the ballot all the time. And we passed this, and the voters said, let's let people take that off so that they can get out of that cycle of poverty. And it's been since 2014, and about 7% of people who are eligible have even started the process, and very few people have gotten through. Why? Same thing as food stamps. Because the process is actually, in this case, not at all online. You have to go to a legal clinic between 9 and 11 on Tuesdays. You have to find the right piece of paper. You've got to fill it out. It asks a lot of questions that are very confusing. Then you have to go get your rap sheet. It is harder to read a rap sheet than it is computer code. You take a class to learn how to read your rap sheet. Then you have to certify that your rap sheet is correct. Then you file more paperwork, and then you wait. It takes about a year. Nobody's doing it. So the voters speak. We say we want this thing, and then it doesn't happen. And it's not because someone's trying to make it not happen. It's because we created this system that is so incredibly hard to use. So, a lot of people tell me that money must be the problem. And I think that there are probably a lot of things in government that are un underfunded. But technology may not be one of those things. Uh, that 52-page uh, application for food stamps, uh, we paid $800 million to have that built, California taxpayers. And it's actually one of three systems. We pay $80 million a year to maintain it, not update it, to maintain it. And is not because it's a high traffic website. Very few people use the site, as you could probably imagine. Um, we spend $470 billion a year on our social safety net. That's a little bit less than what we spend on defense overall. Um, we spend the same percentage of our GDP on the social safety net as Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, about the same, or about a percentage or two less. I don't think we're getting the same benefits as Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. If the problem isn't money, um, well, I think it's a system that's designed to meet government needs and not user needs, otherwise known as human needs. But here's the thing. I am definitely here to tell you that the government is capable of meeting human needs. At Code for America, we borrow an approach from the consumer tech industry. It's basically user-centered, iterative, data-driven approach. And it is absolutely possible and actually very welcome within the halls of government. So we started applying this in cities in 2011. We've now taken it to states and counties. And I took a year off and served in uh, the White House, in fact, with Sylvia Mathwell, uh, Burwell Mathwell, uh, excuse me, Matthews Burwell, um, to start something called the United States Digital Service, which also uses this practice in these approaches. First, that group saved the healthcare.gov site, and then it went on to do dozens and dozens of other projects, including things like getting 85,000 refugees through our, pro our system last year. If we had not fixed a bunch of really difficult paperwork and technological problems, we would not have brought 85,000 refugees into the country. So I'm not talking about theoretical ideas about what could work better. I'm talking about projects we've actually done, and we've done these in the context of that exact same bureaucratic system that results in the government interfaces that you hate. It's absolutely possible. Excuse me. Um, if you want to know, for instance, how Renee finally got enrolled in food stamps, it's through a program that we started called Get CalFresh. It's a very simple mobile app. It takes about seven minutes to apply. You also can upload all your documents at that time. And more importantly, you actually follow, we follow up with our users so we know all of those operational things that happen to them afterwards. Did she get her interview? Was she able to re-enroll? Was she able to apply her document, uh, uh, keep the benefit? Was she able to use it? And what we find is that 
our real value isn't just helping Renee, but that because we have data on all of these people, we can tell all of the California counties on an ongoing basis, here are the top things that you're doing that are keeping people from using your benefits. And when we tell public servants what they can do differently to make it better, they act on it almost every time. They want to make this program work better too. So I was supposed to leave here and run straight for the train and go to DC and help with the Clinton transition team. And I'm not going to do that now, so I'll be able to be around it later. Um, I'm a little sad, but I think about the 27 people that were going to join me there. I spent the last two weeks calling some of the smartest people I know in consumer tech and saying, hey, would you mind dropping everything and coming to DC on no notice for no glory and no pay so that the new administration can pick up these practices and really run with them? And all of them uh, basically said, yes, of course I will, I'll be there. And these aren't people who are looking for jobs in government. They're just people who want to help and they're part of a cohort of people who've been doing this for the past five years in local government and state government at Code for America and at places like the United States Digital Service. And they give me a tremendous amount of hope. Uh, these practices that we're bringing into government, user-centered, iterative, data-driven approaches, they're making government work, but they don't belong to one political party and they don't belong to one administration. I obviously am really proud of the work that the Obama administration has done in this, but if the Trump administration wants to pick up the ball and run with it, I'm gonna support that too, and I hope that they do. If they don't, it doesn't really matter because we live in a country with 50 states and 30,000 municipalities, and that's actually where most people interact with their government anyway. And that's where we're gonna keep doing this work and keep making sure that these government programs work as well as they can because I firmly believe and I can show you that government programs can work just as well as the best consumer services that, they use, that you use, and that when we do that, we can rebuild trust with the American public so that they don't wanna burn it all down. And I hope that you'll help us. Thank you very much. <laughs>